Hello fellow cyborgs and welcome to another 0x19 update. Today I'm going to talk to you about the books I read since I last updated you. I read 5 and DNF'd 2. I'm also going to talk to you about the books that I've hauled since I've last talked with you and the books that I'm currently reading. So unfortunately the last few weeks have been really meh and also I find that the books I'm currently working on are not super getting me excited about what I'm reading. So I'm having a bit of a slumpy time, but I'm still definitely working my way through things and trying to prioritize reading. YouTube is just so tempting. Let's talk about the books that I did manage to finish though. I buddy read Go Tell It on the Mountain by James Baldwin with Sarai from Sarai Talks Books, Kristen from Vienna Waits Books, who's back, yay! Hillary from Your Robot Friend and Acacia Ives. I ended up giving this two out of five stars. It was a very disappointing read for me and I think the problem was my expectations. From the back blurb of this, I was under the impression this was going to be a coming-of-age story, specifically talking about a young man in the 1930s growing up black, but this ended up being more of a conversation about religion and hypocrisy within religion. There were a lot of sermonizing excerpts and some actual sermons in here. For me, I was just really off-put by that, by this negative um, portrayal of religion and it just kind of bummed me out and uh, some of it was actually a slog to get through. Upon finishing it though and talking with some of the ladies, I recognized that I missed a lot of things that were really interesting and compelling and important that were happening in here, specifically when it comes to representation of women and representation of our main character, John himself. But at the time, I couldn't see past my confusion and disappointment to these important things. I think upon rereading this and knowing what I'm in for, it might be more of a three-star read, but my initial impression of Go Tell It on the Mountain was, it was okay. I guess. Disappointing, obviously. I really enjoyed Another Country by James Baldwin. I haven't given up on him as an author, but I'm really glad that this wasn't the first of his books that I picked up. Over the past few weeks, I have been working on a really long book, which I have finished now, but in the interim, I was feeling like I wasn't doing much as far as my TBR, so I picked up a couple shorter works in the hopes of getting them read. Till the Tide, an anthology of mermaid poetry edited by Trista Edwards was one of them. I received this for my birthday a few years ago. I read this whole collection pretty quickly. I, to be fair, I didn't really savor this collection. I kind of wanted to check something off of the list, but regardless, I didn't really enjoy this collection very much. I too gave it a two out of five star. There were two poems in here which I enjoyed, but the rest of them were kind of angsty mermaid sort of poetry and the more angsty, violent interpretation of what a mermaid could be. To be fair, in the introduction, Trista Edwards talks about how these poems look at not just mermaids as like a, a physical being, but all of the representation surrounding mermaids and the connotations and also the different international interpretations of mermaids. So this wasn't just going to be about mermaids, it would be about sirens, it would be about selkies, it would be about dangerous women, it would be all sorts of things. I'm going to read the two poems that I enjoyed in here just so for posterity's sake I can enjoy them by re-watching this video and you can get an idea of what the rest of the poems aren't like. This first one is On Loving a Soldier by Natalie Fisher. If I knew you when the desert was nothing but a turquoise sea, I would rub you against me like a silver fish with puckered lips and slippery skin, or squeeze you tightly with violet tentacles until you remembered how to breathe. I would cover my breasts with stars and tickle your chest with coiled hair, or carry you home on my slick, strong fin if you were too tired or lost your way. But I met you under bone-dry sky where the earth is scorched and hard, and you cannot stop leaking sand from your eyes as you try to forget all that you've done. You lick your cracked lips as I play my guitar, but you can no longer conjure the tune, and your body goes limp when I try to remind you how high you can feel when you sing along. There once was a day when you simply knew how to open a shell, how to wiggle your toes, but your heart is parched and empty now, so I lie in the light and let you go. This second one is Breaking in Ice Skates by M. Brett Gaffney. My feet are trapped inside the white boots, ankle to toe cast in a cocoon of leather and lacquer, screws, and a set of silver swords. 
I think of the mermaid who wanted to be human and how her magical legs ached with each unsteady step. When I skate, cold wind whips my face, the ice uncertain as stormy waves. For weeks, this is the routine, laces like fishers' nets tied to mangle my young toes to grant me the gift of water walking, of flight in winter's fog. After practice, blisters bloom across my soles like algae, blood seeps into socks, into the bathroom rug. This is my transformation, the slow craft of muscle and bone into scales more malleable. To forget the pain, I imagine my skirt spreading to fins in the midst of a scratch spin, the sequins shimmering to pearls in the toe loop. And when I land, when I am done defying gravity, I think of sea foam and the salty collapse of body to water, fish women watching me beneath the ice. So those were the two that I really enjoyed, but the rest of them didn't make an impression on me at all or I actively disliked them, so I won't be keeping this collection. And... I'm disappointed in how much anticipation I had for this. Before I forget, I want to talk to you about Tar Baby by Toni Morrison, which was a buddy read with Sarai Talks books. I listened to this on audiobook, which I really enjoyed listening to it on audiobook, but upon finishing it, both Sarai and I were disappointed, especially as our expectations of Toni Morrison's work. I gave this three out of five stars, so it wasn't by any means a bad book, and I don't in any way regret reading it. But I found that unlike Song of Solomon and God Help the Child, this book dealt with multiple themes instead of one really true main one. And since we had so much, so many themes that we needed to spread our time over, none of them were truly fleshed out, truly explained, and truly came to a conclusion. I also found the ambiguous ending too ambiguous for such an ambiguous book in itself. I wanted a little bit more direction with this story, knowing what was the point and really knowing what we were supposed to be thinking about these many broad themes. I think upon rereading it and reading it in a physical form, I can probably pick through some of these subtle details and form more coherent thoughts. But I don't know about you, but when I listen to an audiobook, it's difficult for me to slow my reading and to really think about what just happened since the audiobook will propel itself forward until the end if I don't pause it. So I didn't take the time to go back and really think things through in the middle of a scene where I would have had an easier time of doing that had I physically read it. So I enjoyed this, but I don't know the point of this story and it didn't measure up to the other Morrisons I've read so far. I then picked up Conservation of Shadows by Yoon Ha Lee, which is a science fiction fantasy short story collection. I I read the first three stories and then decided to DNF this with a two-star rating because the short stories, I didn't hate them, but they weren't compelling enough for me to want to continue on with this collection. The first short story had a really odd ending which made me feel like I didn't know what was going on. The second short story had a really similar sort of magic system or science system as the first and kind of ble bled into one another. And the third short story I felt was more like an outline of a novel. The sort of overarching plot was just so reminiscent of something that would be novel length that the fact that it was taken down into a short story length that just seemed super weird. So by that point, I was kind of done um, and over it. I would like to try more by Yoon Ha Lee, especially Nine Fox Gambit, but I'm not going to take the time to read through the rest of these stories, unfortunately. If you think I'm making a bad decision and there are some short stories in here I need to read before giving it away, please let me know. But otherwise, I'm not going to spend my time on this anymore. My second DNF was The Waves by Virginia Woolf. I started reading this in January of 2016 on a plane ride and I really enjoyed it and I found that it was um, interesting to pick apart these little things that were happening. But this is a really weird, very experimental book and for me it's just too experimental. I even got the audiobook out from the library in hopes that that might help me actually continue picking this up, but it didn't help. I was just more confused than, than ever. I'm not sure if The Waves is a book that you really should read on audiobook. Anyway, so I gave this about like 40 pages from what I can tell from the audiobook matching up to the book. And I was just like, <laughs> I have three more wolves on my shelf. Wolves? Wolves? Mm, it's weird. On my TBR shelf, and I feel like some of those might be a better match to me. Or it's possible that I just liked 
the room of one's own and to the lighthouse and that's fine too. So eh. the highest rated book this last update period, I think it was about four or five weeks or so, was a poetry collection, Sparkle Fat, Poems That Intend to Be Seen by Melissa May. I gave this four out of five stars because I really liked the themes in these poems and I found that a collection like this is super important, one that explores unconventional body types and the way unconventional is even the wrong word because it's not like there aren't really fat people in the world it's just that their voice isn't like important to society at large so this collection was doing something that needs to be done more often i enjoyed a couple of the poems a lot but i did breeze through this pretty quickly just like with the mermaid anthology of poetry i did want to read to you one of my favorite poems in this collection and one that is pretty famous i guess there's a youtube video of her reading it or something like that. It's called Dear Ursula. So this is actually kind of a long poem and I don't want to take up a lot of time reading poetry in this video even though I already have. So I'm just going to read the introduction and the first long stanza. In 2012, Disney released a line of villain dolls depicting Ursula, the classically full-figured sea witch from The Little Mermaid, as a designer couture size zero. Dear Ursula, a letter of condolence. From one rolling midsection and tameless will to another, my sweet Ursula, I cannot imagine the sick flip of your stomach to see your image dissected, chins shaved, waist cinched, your silhouette robbed of every ounce of delicious curve. To find, after two decades of existence, that your evil was more worthy of your preservation than the iconic body that held you, you, big lady, were the only Disney character that ever looked like me. And while you may not have had the waistline of a princess, I'll be goddamned if you didn't have the swagger of a queen. The way you sashayed around your lair in full makeup, black flamenco number cut so low in your back that your every twist and shimmy displayed the gorgeous tuck of your rolls. You made back fat look fucking sexy. So I really liked this poem. It was I liked the theme of Disney's Ursula, and I also liked how it talks about what the public eye, what commercialism wants to do to bodies and how they want to make them all look the same. And I especially liked how it was Ursula's evilness was something to be preserved, but not her fatness. Kind of effed up, huh? So anyway, Sparkle Fat, I recommend, and I will have to read this more closely in the future. The most triumphant read of this last few weeks was The Way We Live Now by Anthony Trollope. So this is about a thousand pages long. My edition, weirdly, at the end of volume one, starts over the page number at one, which was super frustrating, calculating where I was in the book. But anyway, it wasn't super frustrating. It was just a little annoying. So overall, I gave this three out of five stars. And I think the problem with this, in my opinion, is that it was too long. There were no numerous character conversations and like thought processes and vacillations that characters had with themselves or with others multiple times. And this happened for multiple characters. So even though a lot happens in this, I don't think that the amount that happened is justified by the amount of pages it took to have them happen. I do have a better idea of what this is about though, so I can tell you a little bit more. So this follows a couple families and how they intermix, which I think you've gleaned from before. We follow the Melmots who have a lot of money and no one knows their heritage and how noble they truly are, but because they have a lot of money, they can get away with a lot. There's also the Carberries, Lady Carberry and her two adult children children, her son who's a good for nothing who spends money like a fish breathes water, and Henrietta who is currently being courted by two men, one of whom is her cousin Roger who's older and kind of a man of the Regency era and he lives and controls and shepherds I, there's a better word for it, but I can't think of it right now. The family estate in the country. The rest of the Carberries live in London along with the Melmots. There are a couple other aristocratic families that we touch on, and there are two really interesting characters that are kind of on their own. One is Paul Montague, who's a young man whose money is tied up in America because reasons. And there's also an American widow named Mrs. Hurdle who is interesting. I really liked her, but it got really annoying after a while to hearing her constantly talked about as either a wild cat or a nasty American woman, depending upon who was talking about her. And I don't know what that really says about Americans. And as me being an American, it's like, okay, sure, we're nasty wild cats. 
There are a bunch of love triangles, like four of them. There are a bunch of marriage proposals and reneges and maybe actually there are money being grown and money inexplicably not being there anymore. I really liked the psychological complexity in here. I liked the balance of romance versus politics and money as far as themes go and romance and gender, uh, uh, engagement and gender, marriage and gender, whatever. I really liked that balance. It kept me interested um, for someone who really likes more of the social stuff with the Victorian era, not so much the money and politics. I really enjoyed Anthony Trollope's writing style. He's one of my new favorite Victorian authors and I really want to read more by him. I'm planning on acquiring the first couple volumes of the Barsetshire Chronicles soon, so maybe I'll start on that this year, maybe I won't. But I thought this was too long and I think part of the issue is that I really don't do really well with really long books. Any book that takes me more than three weeks to read, I think it's because it's a slog, not because it's huge. And that's my big, my big bad. So I enjoyed this. I'm glad I read it. Also, I forgot to mention I buddy read it with Katie from Books and Things and Marissa from Blatantly Bookish. And I'm really glad that I buddy read it with them. It was interesting picking things apart, but this is also a really hard book to buddy read unless everybody ends at the exact same time every single day because so much happens and yet so little happens and it's kind of hard to know what to talk about when you're trying to avoid spoilers. So anyway, the way we live now. This is why I haven't, I only read five books in the last few weeks. That's what I tell myself. I mean, whatever. It's fine. So I read five books and I DNF two, which means I got rid of seven from my physical TBR. I did add three to my physical TBR, however, which I'm going to show you presently, which means I currently have 93 books on my physical TBR shelf, shelves, bookcase, in mid-March. Okay, we'll get to that face later. Let's talk about the books I acquired. This is The Red Tree by Caitlin R. Kiernan. I purchased this to support the Sword and Laser podcast. They have an affiliate link through Amazon, one of my last Amazon purchases, because the Amazon just doesn't need my money. This is a atmospheric horror centering around this old red oak tree on the property that seems to invade the thoughts of the people who live there, and a solitary writer who has come there to write her next novel, I think it is. I heard about this from Maya Reads, from Maya, from Maya Reads. I really enjoy her channel and I love how soft-spoken and calming her videos are. I've been eyeballing this for months and months and when it was like super cheap and would help a podcast that I really like, I decided to just bite the bullet and pick it up. I'm hoping to read this very soon. Next were two mysteries that I picked up. My mother really loves mysteries and I love the idea of some mysteries, though I don't read them very often. I'm hoping to read both of them over the Easter break along with my mom and do kind of like a mom-daughter body, body read. Buddy read. I heard about these from Kate from the novel Nomad. And Only to Deceive is by Tasha Alexander. It's a novel of suspense. It's set in the Victorian era and follows a, a widow as she discovers that this husband she was very indifferent to actually loved her very much and starts to think twice about the hunting accident that happened while he was on safari in Africa and led to his death. So I'm excited about the Victorian era aspect. I'm also excited about the widowhood aspect, though I'm certain that she won't be a widow for long from what I can tell of future books in the series. So We'll see, but I'm really looking forward to trying this one out. I also picked up The Dry by Jane Harper, which is a contemporary Australian written and Australian set mystery. It's apparently part of the new phase of mystery books where you're pulled back into your small hometown setting and have to deal with who you are now versus who you were then and how people deal with you. This was also really raved about by Leanne from Literary Diversions, which makes me pleased that two people have really enjoyed this. The premise of this is that Alex Aaron has to go back to his small rural hometown after having left it for his former best friend's funeral. While there, things come up and his best friends, I think it's a suicide, a supposed suicide, maybe isn't a suicide after all, and a mystery that they shared from their childhood, which caused Aaron and his father to leave the small town comes back to light and things start having to be unraveled. And Aaron's a constable? Federal agent. 
so he knows all those police stuff. This is highly recommended and I really liked how Kate talked about it being gothic in its isolation. I'm really excited to read this and hope that it will be a fast fun read to get me out of my slump in a couple weeks. So let's talk about my face real quick before I get into what I'm currently reading. This face is thinking, can I do this physical TBR 0 by 19 challenge after all? Am I reading enough? Is there any possible way that I'll be able to do what I want to do? And just feeling a little bit frustrated and I don't know. Apparently I'm just in a mood, guys, <sighs> for no reason. It's not like my life is super stressful right now, but sometimes you just, you just get into these moods. And right now I'm feeling like the zero by 19 challenge is something that I should still work toward, but something that I probably shouldn't hold my breath on. And I think that's just really disappointing. I know that I need to change some of my behavior and really spend my free time reading instead of watching YouTube videos, but I'm torn between the motivation to better myself by reading books. I don't know if the books I'm reading truly better me, but that's what I perceive. I perceive reading as a successful and improving and a hobby that is something I can be proud of. Whereas watching YouTube videos, I don't feel like is something to be proud of, which is stupid because there are some YouTube videos that have made me question things and learn things more than some books that I've read. So it's just this stigma going around in my brain. And even though I find reading more makes me feel more proud of myself. It's harder to do. And sometimes it's like, do I want to better myself through reading or do I want to enjoy my afternoon? Because I can pick one or the other and they're not going to necessarily coincide. I don't know. Little tiny m rant over. Um, if you have comments, let me know in the comments section. And let's move on to the books that I'm currently reading and just move on. I'm still plugging away at the Selected Stories by Saki. I'm on page like 200 or so now, so I'm trying to read one story a day before I go to bed. That's been working out 75% of the time, so hopefully over the next month or so I will get through the remaining stories. I'm still really enjoying this three to four star rating at this point. They're still delightful and funny and I, I'm really liking them. Also here I have volume one of the complete novels by Jane Austen in here. I'm rereading Pride and Prejudice with one of my friends here in California. I'm not actually enjoying this a whole lot compared to the loquacious nature of Anthony Trollope's writing style. Jane Austen's writing style right now is seeming almost like bullet points to a story. And while I know she's famed for her character development, I'm finding that more of the novel is spent on just moving the plot forward. So it's this, I don't really know. Please don't hate me, Jane Austen lovers. I'm not a Jane Austen lover, I'm a Jane Austen liker. So we'll see how this goes, but this will be a fairly slow reading process. We're just reading, you know, a handful of chapters every week or so. So I'm plugging away on this reread, which isn't going to help on my physical TBR, but that's fine. Whatever. Friendship rereading is important. I'm currently buddy reading The Scapegoat by Daphne du Maurier with Acacia Ives. I'm about halfway through this so far. We're reading two chapters a day. I'm enjoying it, but I don't think that Daphne du Maurier is a favorite author of mine. Her novels are full of suspense and anxiety and building tension. When I go to read, I really don't want to feel that anxiety and building tension because I go to reading to escape my anxiety and tension. And for Du Maurier, she just forces me to feel those feelings, but for other characters. This is about a man who meets his doppelganger, and his doppelganger ends up stealing his identity and leaves him with the doppelganger's identity. So we have John, who is faking to be Jean, an owner of a chateau in rural France, and the weird effed up family that he has there, and also the failing glass foundry. Lots of potential drama, no actual drama yet, but lots of tension. Well, not lots of tension, a bit of tension. It's fine. I'm going to keep plugging away. I'm enjoying it, but I don't think it's going to be a new love of mine. It'll probably be about three stars. I've also started An Unkindness of Ghosts by Rivers Solomon. 
partially because this came highly recommended by Acacia Ives and partly because the Sword and Laser podcast is reading it in the month of March. I'm not very far. I'm finished part one, which is about 100 pages in. Well, 100 pages is kind of far. There's this building sense of dread, which makes is making me not want to pick this up. And this is kind of a hard read too. It's on a generation ship far in the future, which has subsumed the cultural structure of the antebellum South. All of that, all of the threats that happened to slaves in the antebellum South on plantations are present in these people's lives. One thing that is surprising that I really enjoy, this book is playing with gender. The Tarlanders, who are a group of brown and darker skinned people on the lower decks of this generation ship, have a genetic hormonal abnormality, which means that a lot of them are intersexed, which too might not, I might not, I might be using the wrong terminology, but in essence, they have characteristics of both the sexes on them. So you might have female genitalia, but have a very muscular and hairy body type. So because of that, there are different pronouns used on the different decks, which are kind of contained cultures because deck access is restricted. So one deck called all children she, another deck calls all children they, and it seems like there's this gender fluid, um, at least as far as the language goes which I'm really enjoying. I just the dread, just the what's going to happen? Is someone going to get raped? I don't know. Which is part of the reason why I picked up a middle grade because apparently middle grade March is happening. I don't know these things. Um, and this is my attempt at finding something that is lighthearted and entertaining and something that it brings me happy feelings when I come to it. This is Journey to the River Sea by Eva Ibbotson. I really like Eva Ibbotson a lot. She's one of my favorite children's authors. And so I read a couple first chapters of some of the middle grade on my shelves, and this was the one that sounded really interesting. This follows Maya, who is was born to English parents and is living in England, but her parents were killed a couple years ago. It's been newly discovered that she has family members living in the Amazon in Brazil, and so she is taken to go live with them. And it appears so far, I'm about 70 pages in, but I don't think this is a huge spoiler to say that the family that she expected to find in the Amazon are not the family that she actually got. They remind me of the Dursleys a little bit. So she's having to reconcile her feelings about Brazil and the Amazon, her expectations of Brazil and the Amazon, her feelings and expectations toward her family members, and then also she has a governess, Miss Minton, who's awesome and I'm really glad she's in this story. I'm enjoying this so far, and I'm hoping that this will help get me out of my slump. I'm hoping that this will be more than a three-star read. Unlike pretty much all the other books I'm currently reading, I'm thinking are just gonna be three-star reads, and three stars are fine, but I don't want my reading just to be fine. So yeah, no five stars so far this year, which is disappointing. My favorite book of the year so far is still The Haunting of Hill House. Nothing I have read in this disappointing month has beaten that, which is unfortunate, but you know, at least there's The Haunting of Hill House. Wish me luck on my slumpy attitude. Let me know how your reading has been in the last few weeks. And also I would love some recommendations on how to get out of slumps and how to increase my love of reading. Anything, is there anything that you do when you want to be reading, but you don't choose to be reading? I don't know. I mean, I'm sure some of you very wise people will say, don't fret. Just do what makes you happy. Don't worry about it. It's not a competition. But, you know, the 0 by 18 challenge I failed at, and I really want to make some good progress on the 0 by 19. So I'll do my best. Until next time, I hope that you cyborgs have a much easier time reading and a much more enjoyable time reading than I currently am. And I hope that you continue to be lovely.